This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10 day trial, visit Lynda.com slash Know How. That's L Y N D A dot com slash Know How. And by the Ring Video Doorbell. With the built-in HD camera and microphone, you can monitor your front door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like being home even when you're not. Right now, get $10 off the Ring Video Doorbell when you go to ring.com slash knowhow. Today on Know How, we've got Magic Concrete. It's a maker special with some laser cutting. 3D printing. And, uh, oh, I don't know, a twit bag. The know how it's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballester. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next minutes, we're going to be showing you some of the projects that we've been working on so you can take them home and work on them yourselves. That's right. And uh, we might be a little rusty today. Yes. Because we have done pre records previously. Yes. And so we haven't actually done this in a week. And you've been gone I've a been lot. Gone. I, you know, we pretty much only do know how every two weeks now because I'm always on the road covering events. Uh, right. Last week was crazy busy. I had TechCrunch disrupt. Right. And actually, uh, before that, I had TechCrunch disrupt the hackathon, then TechCrunch disrupt, then Maker Faire in New York, and I did a little Pope stuff. So, I mean... Right. It's, oh, yeah, you, know, you know, no big deal. Easy week. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, and no uh, which of those things was your favorite to attend? Um, I would say the Pope stuff, except I've done that before. Right. So it was very nice, but Maker Faire was pretty incredible. Uh, In fact, I got... I'm one, a little jealous. Did, did, I didn't get to go this time. time? Uh, I have one. It looks a little different. I think it was um, from San Mateo. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really nice of you. To, <laughs> I'm sorry. To bring I'm sorry. That no. back with you. I, I, you know, I, I thought that when people were saying that the World Maker Fair was was bigger than San Mateo, I thought, yeah. okay, but it can't be that much bigger. Because the one in San Mateo is pretty it's big. It's pretty dang big. It I mean, took it's... us all day to go around and see everything. Exactly. And it's the entire San Mateo fairground. It's inside of, what, five different buildings as right. well as outside. And it's dense. There's it's a, very dense. Like, inside of those warehouses and stuff, each little cubicle has some other project that right. you could spend an hour just looking at. But then I got to the World Maker Fair, and no, that thing is huge. Right. It is, <laughs> it is gargantuan. It is crazy, crazy big. And... I, I have to say, the feel was a little bit different. I mean, <laughs> here in the Bay Area, it does kind of have a little bit of the hippie flair. I mean, yeah, you get, well, which I like. You get the uh, the Burning Man effect, You right? get the Burning Man effect. You don't get as many kids. In New York, it was a lot of kids. It was a lot of, like, really techie-type people. Not right. so much with the Burning Man vibe. Right. There were some of those exhibits, but it was a lot of stuff I had not seen before. And I really liked it. So there wasn't any like Mad Max guitar flame shooting. Uh, there was mechanisms? a robot that shot flames, and Mousetrap is there, and they <gasps> crushed that car. I saw the video you brought back yeah. from that. Yeah, that but uh, if yeah. I had had that as a kid, it would have been dangerous. Uh, I would have been dead. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you know, before we get into all the maker goodness, because mm -hmm. we do want to have a little bit of a maker special, and actually, we want to show off some of the stuff that we made. I made. Uh, yeah, I it was hired. Like you're putting the stuff. 3D printer to good use now. Yeah, I, I'm. You know, I'm really getting into this fast prototyping. So I thought we should do a segment on what fast prototyping means because mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people actually understand what that means. They just they think, well, it means you can make something. Well, yes and no. We'll go through that process. But first, I wanted to talk about a silent killer, Brian. Silent killer. It's out there. It's lurking. It's is waiting it, for you. Is it here in the studio? It could be. Uh, that's nothing new. I'm used to that. It's puddles of water. Uh, that doesn't sound that dangerous. It's definitely not in California. We don't have it. <laughs> yeah, anymore. actually, I would be welcome that. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, no, seriously, uh, if when we do have rain, mm -hmm. you have seen this. When we get a lot of rain, it can get very unsafe on the road. Not just on the roadways, but it's unsafe right. in parking lots. It's unsafe in the parking garage. It's unsafe in sidewalks. Yep. And it's all about drainage. Anyone who lives in a temperate climate where you get splashes of rain understands how dangerous it can be to have pools of water. Uh, it's, it's just not, it's not good for you. It can right. cause structural damage, uh, not just you, know, you slipping on it. But also pools of water can do things in, say, San Francisco where we have nice big 
ponds of mosquitoes. Ah, uh, yeah, kind of yeah. I actually that happens to you frequently near where you live, doesn't it? Yeah, I actually have a mosquito net because uh, <laughs> like once a month there's a new breeding cycle and they are everywhere. I mean, yeah. And I eat that noise. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the me. worst. But I, I'm guessing there's something that has been created to uh, To get rid of that? the killer of water. <laughs> The water killer. I don't know. Water. Yeah, it's it's permeable concrete. Have you ever heard about about this porous concrete, permeable concrete? I mean, I can grasp the idea, but I don't think I've ever seen it in action. Yeah, and actually, we have a video to show you in action. This is what it looks like. Now, the idea is you take concrete mm -hmm. with its regular aggregate mix, and you make it more porous. You make it uh, so that water can slip readily through it. And Alex should be playing a video right about now, uh, but uh, hopefully, at some point, he'll get to it. Uh, now. They've come up with a couple of different formulations for this. The concrete, asphalt, it's all loose paving. Right. And the idea is, of course, if Alex would play the video, we will uh, we have the ability to create a surface that lets water drain through it incredibly quickly. Wow, that's uh, actually that. a lot quicker this than I would have imagined. 4,000 liters that are draining through this in about 60 seconds. Is there some sort of like culvert system underneath the, uh, uh, the pavement? That's or the is thing. It just I mean, going straight to the You ground? could have that, but then it that would dramatically increase the price. Right. Because you'd have to essentially put a liner down before you put this. So this is designed to be directly applied, just like you would concrete or, uh -huh. or asphalt. Uh, now, again, there are a few concerns that they have about this, but uh, I... Essentially, this is, it looks like concrete, it acts like concrete or asphalt, mm -hmm. but it allows liquids to drain straight through it. Wow. Now, if you live in an area that is very prone to sinkholes or freezing, you could have issues because you don't want this water to get in there, sit, and then freeze. It will break <laughs> apart. Yeah, because I imagine it would expand and then break up the structure of the, the concrete. Yes, yes, it would. And Oof. the other part is if you live in an area that is prone to sinkholes, having water go straight through it would actually increase the rate of sinkholes. That's which, what I was trying to think yeah, of, that's, yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a bad Ooh. thing. Well, I, I first saw this story, uh, Brian Chebert, your co-host on This Week in Enterprise Tech, had shown it on his uh, Facebook, and he said this would be great for the kind of climate they have in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, actually, yes, very, very much so. And they do have this issue where drainage, you don't get enough of it, and if you pull up enough water, you get really bad things. You, you get structural issues. Right. Uh, now, there is a solution for this where you can put like a lining of solid concrete and then this on top and then you get a really nice drainage effect. But mm -hmm. again, that, that would be ridiculously more. expensive. Uh, but... Oh, that's cool. The and uh, when, when you think of the fact that a, a porous concrete or a porous asphalt would actually allow for it to last a lot longer, I, I, think, I think the cost could be borne out. Yeah, well, uh, actually, before I started working at Twit, I used to do parking lot design. Ex ah. It was an exciting job. Uh, but I think a lot of places had to replace their asphalt in their parking lot uh, yep. after about five to six years, and it's not cheap. No, it's not. So you got you got to rip it up, and then you got to lay it down, and it's yeah. So if if I can get a solution that will last longer and won't destroy itself by puddling water, I'm, I'm all down with that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. I Actually, when you had mentioned this story, I thought, oh yeah, you know, it drains a little bit, but it's it's almost instantaneous. As soon as the water hits oh, yeah. it, it just drains comes immediately. Right comes right through. All right, well, we will be coming back to porous concrete in a bit because I, I, I actually want to whip up a batch, but um, Brian, I think we've got a little little something something from a member of the audience who uh, wanted me to check something out at Maker Fair. Oh yeah, this comes from Freddie Lower Lowers. Freddie Lowers, and he asks, "How much cooler can things get?" Check this out, Glowforge.com. Ooh, what is it? Yeah, well, this is supposed to be a laser cutting machine. Oh, he says this is only a little bit more than Leo Laporte pays for his iPhone 6 Plus. That's a joke. Uh, it's 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 two thousand dollars, but oh, so two iPhones. Though. Yeah, but three D cutting is um, it's a little different than three D printing. Uh, mm. You a lot of the same skills are there, but uh, it's it's yet another tool that has now come down in price so that it will be available to the maker. So mm. uh, Alex, if you could press that magic button. For precision, nothing beats lasers. Now, the laser game, as far as etching and cutting, has always been a little cost prohibitive. Some of the more advanced units have been running 20, 
30, $40,000. Well, Glowforge is here to change that game. I'm speaking with Dan, who's going to explain what they brought to the show. Dan, what do you got? Thanks so much for having me. This is a desktop laser, 12 by 20 cutting area, 40 or 45 watts available. But the real magic is that we put Wi-Fi in it and we brought all the hard processing up to the cloud, which let us lower the costs down to under $2,000 for the basic model and lets us add all sorts of crazy features like the onboard camera can identify your MacBook, set the proper engraved settings, bring up a template so everything's centered perfectly. You can bring in materials that we provide. It'll scan them and pick up the uh, uh, an invisible barcode and set all the materials settings. Or you can bring your own materials and save them. You can do things like, from your iPad, drag your design onto the material wherever you want it to be, hit print, and off it goes. You can even draw directly onto the material. And it'll engrave over the top of the ink and then cut out the perimeter. The perimeter so kids can make toys. We had an amazing illustrator who worked with Mayfair Games and helped us do a licensed Settlers of Catan set, which I can show you over here. And it's just beautiful. You Can you do anything from CAD all the way down to a doodle and make something amazing out of it? Now that part is absolutely amazing. The ability to basically put a template over the top of the material that you're trying to engrave, and the laser will just follow. Uh, this reminds me a lot of where 3D printers were, say, two, three years ago, where they were still kind of jury-rigged. There weren't a lot of real good commercial units available, and they just kept coming down and down in price and up and up in quality. I think you're at the front of that. Now, tell me, what needs to happen for this to become the tool that every maker will have? We're off to a good start. We opened pre-orders two days ago, and when I left the hotel this morning, we were at $2.2 million in pre-orders. So it was a good opener. <laughs> and really, for us, it's so gratifying. We knew, we thought we knew that there was demand there, and to see people come out and say, yes, we want this, we need this, let's go make stuff together, nothing is more exciting about that. You know, I sometimes think, it's almost as if the whole world didn't have kitchens and everybody was buying fast food. What is the world going to look like when you can make the things you want? You can make a shoulder bag, you can make a toy, you can make a dollhouse, you can make a drone, and you can print what you want, the way you want it, right there for less cost than you'd buy it online. That is what I'm excited about bringing out, and I'm really excited to be here at Maker Faire to show it to folks. All right, let's get down to brass tacks. Let's say I've got one of these in my maker space. I want to engrave something. What are the steps that I would have to do? I mean, literally take me through what I'd have to do to engrave the laptop lid that, uh, that I want to show the Twit logo on. So you have two choices. The first choice is you put it in, you open up the interface, and you say scan. It will say, I see that you've got a MacBook Pro. Which template would you like to use, or would you like to use your own? You pick one, and you hit print. That's option one. Option two, this is going to sound weird, you can write on your MacBook Pro with a Sharpie. Put it in there and say, go over the Sharpie with the laser. That's option two. I love it. Now, this is fantastic technology. If they wanted to find out more about where they could pick up a Glowforge, find out maybe what's going on with the pre-orders, where can they go? So for the next 28 days after Maker Faire, you can go to glowforge.com and get one of these for as little as $19.95 for the base unit. And I'll show you some of the things we made with the base unit. It's pretty incredible. It's fantastic. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. This has been Glowforge. And with this, you can see a B. I can't see a B. I get it. I C's. get it. Cut a board. Cut a, bo Cut a board. You got that? Yeah, it was that was clever. Right? Uh, did you make that same joke there? No. <laughs> yeah, you would wait till after the yeah, interview. The guy yeah. was just like, "Wait, what? Uh, why would you do that?" Now, uh, well, I I really like that machine. I love the fact that you could trace and then put something over the material, and it will actually follow your trace. Yeah, the the MacBook example mm, was pretty cool. That's really cool. Or or just like if if you're one of these people who likes to put things down on draft, you yeah, just, you just draft it out, put it down have it cut, it actually cuts really, really quickly. You get your, your fast prototyping pieces immediately, and then once you kind of understand what you want with it, then you lay it down into a CAD program. I like that idea. That, that was pretty nifty. It's a cool device, still a little pricey. I mean, $2,000 is, is way below what you would have to pay for a high quality one. There's, there's right. one on eBay right now that you can buy for $300, <laughs> and I was thinking about it, yeah. but I mean, it's the build platform is tiny, and <laughs> I mean, there's there's a bunch of stuff you have to do to it before oh. it actually becomes usable. This yeah. is one of these devices where off the shelf, it works, it works properly. Right. It has it's some great features built into it. I love the fact that they're moving a lot of the processing up to the cloud, which, you know, it frees up 
uh, me to, to not have to pay so much for every generation of machine. So I, I think I think Glowforge is on the right track. Yeah, and I was impressed at uh, all the different materials that you could use with it. And then I know you were uh, you were uh, glancing at that quadcopter they yes. built. A little there's yep. a little drool there. A twin Gatling gun quadcopter. Yeah. Oh, rubber band. <laughs> rubber band. band yeah. Uh, yeah. It will cut wood. Uh, it will cut acrylic. Uh, and you, if you prep aluminum right, uh -huh. it will cut aluminum. So the, the problem with aluminum is it's too reflective. So that's a 45 watt laser, right. but it will bounce most of the energy away. So you can put a substance on the aluminum or a film on the aluminum. Makes it less reflective? R well, it, yeah, it, it absorbs the heat. It's huh. basically black. You're adding black to the top layer so that all the power of the laser is absorbed. It will cut through, shit, through uh, very thin sheets of aluminum. It's not like a laser CNC where you're gonna cut half an inch steel. Right. But uh, you'd be surprised how much utility you could get out of nice, strong plywood, which yeah. is what this really excels at. Well, and then behind him and during the interview, too, was that, uh, I guess it was a dollhouse or something, but right. it, you could see how intricate the design was, like how close the, uh, the etching was. And yeah. Well, we, I want to talk about that a little bit later because uh, we will be talking about fast prototyping. And one of the things to, to, to think about when you fast prototype are the tools that are available to you. Because right now, the, everyone is all about 3D printing. Right. Because 3D printing looks cool, the process looks cool, but there's a bunch of parallel developments. There's 3D printing, there's CNC, which is actually you know cutting negative space into solid materials. Right. There's things like laser etching, which we just saw with the Glowforge, which will allow us to make uh, 2D parts that then fit together into a 3D matrix. Right. Uh, and all of these together allow us to change what we think is possible in our home labs. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the possibilities, they're growing. Pop, they're they're growing. You know what else is growing? Your knowledge hole? My knowledge hole. My knowledge hole is thirsty. It wants more and more knowledge. Oh, if, only, if only, Cranky Hippo, there were a place on the internet where I could get my fill for my knowledge hole. I think there is a place. Where is that? That's Linda, Linda.com. Linda. Yeah, that's right, Linda.com. Now, Linda.com is a one-stop shop. It's a repository for knowledge. Uh, imagine it being a place where you could go to learn new skills, things that you don't know. Like, for example, you need some There's training a for a new job. Yep. Or, or perhaps you want to learn a bit more about 3D modeling, maybe about laser cutting, maybe about 3D printing. I do need to brush up on my AutoCAD skills. Your AutoCAD skills. Photography. Maybe you want to pick up a new hobby. Or, or maybe you just need to reference stuff that you already know that you've forgotten a tiny bit. I mean, we had that here at the Twit Burke House when we switched over from Adobe, I mean, so uh, from, from, from Final, Final Cut, Cut yeah. Final Cut on the Mac to Adobe Premiere Pro on the PC. Our editors needed some place where they could go to quickly get answers, and that place was lynda.com. Lynda.com is for the curious, for the doers, for the makers, for the people who want to make things happen. If you want to feed your curious mind, you need to feed it uh, lynda.com. Oh, if you're interested in photography or you want to take better photos, you're going to want to check out lynda.com. They just added two excellent courses for beginners. Introduction to photography and getting started with photography. There's also a five-day photo challenge course to improve your composition skills, plus new courses on color correction and making selective adjustments in Adobe Camera Raw, plus remastering curves in Photoshop and the fundamentals of Photoshop CC 2015. Uh, with the Lynda.com membership, you can watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. You can stream thousands of video courses on demand and learn on your own schedule. Learning on your own schedule is actually very important because when you learn the way that you want to learn rather than the way that a tool is telling you to learn, the information stays with you. And that really is the best way to fill your knowledge hole. You could browse each course transcript to follow along or to jump to a spot inside of a course that will answer your specific questions, again, about something that maybe you've learned but have somewhat forgotten. You can take notes as you go and refer to them later. You could download tutorials and watch them on the go on your Android or iOS devices. You can create and save playlists of courses that you want to watch to customize your learning path or to share it with friends, colleagues, and team members. Uh, we want you to try lynda.com. Trust me, it's going to be one of the best decisions you make. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one low flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow and sign up for your free 10-day trial. Once again, that's lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash Know How. And we thank Linda for their support of Know How.
Brian. Yeah. You know this whole fast prototyping craze? You keep talking about this fast prototyping. I thing. do, because a lot of people are talking about fast prototyping. <laughs> but the yeah. question is, I don't know if people actually understand what fast prototyping entails. Uh, so I'm guessing it's just printing really fast and then getting to play with what you want. No. <laughs> kind of, kind of. I mean, that's, that's how most people think of it. People yeah. think, oh, it just means I can print something here rather than sending it out. Yeah. Which is part of it. I mean, the, the advancement of tools like 3D printers, like laser cutters, like CNC tools that are, are actually affordable, they allow me to print in my home lab or my home office rather than having to go to a shop or right. rather than having to send it out. Yeah. That used to be the way that you, you would do it. Well, and I don't know about you, but I don't like to leave the house ever. No. So, <laughs> so one of these would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that about you, but okay, this is, this is good. But I, let's talk a little bit about what it means to fast prototype. Uh, recently, when I was mm -hmm. heading over to Maker Faire, the, actually the night before, uh, as I was packed up and I was watching The Blacklist on Netflix, I just kind of got into it. I don't right. know why. It was one of these weird things. That's a good show. Uh, yeah, but then I thought, okay, so when you go to these conferences, they always give you a badge. Right. right? That's how they tell whether or not you're supposed to be but there. But everybody gets a badge. Everybody gets a badge. So I thought, what What if we did a little something something for Twit? <laughs> to you know, <laughs> to make it a little special. Make it a little to special. Stand out a little bit. It's Maker fair, so you, you kind of want to bring something that's kind of cool. Right. Why should DEF CON have all the rights on cool badges? Exactly, exactly. So I, I made this. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is jank. This is super, jank. super jank. Oh, but it's so cute. So I, I just, I, I did a 3D printed box inside of. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty jank, all right. <laughs> inside of Tinkercad. Uh, now the, the design is simple. It's a box that has yeah. a bunch of LEDs, and then it has this. This is this is the actual badge. It's the lid, right? Right. And uh, the problem is when I first made this, because I made the entire thing out of clear materials, it the LED LED lights were overpowering. You right. couldn't see anything else. Yeah, because you have the Twit logo and you have the uh, Twit um, lettering on there, so but you, it would just be blown you see that, out. You see that paint? <laughs> that paint. Yeah, I kind of... It's uh, Sharpie. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't translate well on the camera, yeah, so but that's I, definitely Sharpie. I had 3D printed this, and I was like, oh, it's time to go to bed. I got to go to the airport in a couple of hours, and I don't want to paint this, so I'm sure Sharpie will be okay. Uh, it's it's not like a okay, high school the student with their art project the night before. <laughs> I uh, felt so bad, too, because when I got there, people were saying, like, oh, you're from Twit. Can I take a picture of badge? I'm like, please don't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> only if you're using a really old camera. Right. But again, I used Tinkercad for this, and we showed that to them, uh, was it last week? I think it was last or maybe the week before. Mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, uh, Tinkercad, yeah. yeah. Quite simply, it was a box, and then you put an empty box and inside of it. Subtra subtracted that. You subtract the it. material, so you get this nice... Let me, let me turn this off so people can actually see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. You go to the side view here, Alex. It's a box inside of a box that uh, you will see when Alex goes to the side view. Uh, so there we go. So, yo dog, I heard you like boxes, so I put a box in your box. That's that's all it is. It's just LEDs that mm -hmm. are stuck to the side. It's a single JST connector that hooks it up to these 1,000 amp hour batteries. Well, that we and used. like you were saying earlier, you have a lot of these laying around all of a I sudden. I have a lot. Because uh, your quads have elevated to the level where these just aren't adequate anymore. Exactly. But they're exactly. great. Like, I've used these to power my Raspberry Pi They're great now. for these little yeah. boxes. And then the lid, again, if you go to the side view, Alex, I, I don't, you can see that beveled edge. Oh. So this was that. just a box on top of a box. It's a smaller box on top of a larger box. <laughs> so you just shrink it down a little You shrink bit. it down so that it gives you that little lip. Yeah. And that lip, if if you do it properly, allows it to snap in. And then fall off when you're demonstrating. fall off when I shake. Well, that's that's the problem with this because I've, I've used it so much that it's it, gotten it loose. doesn't have much friction. Now oh, it now it won't, out, yeah. You know? But, okay, so this was version zero. Mm -hmm. this, so this was a fast prototype. This was super fast. This was, okay, let's just put a badge on the box. Uh, the hardest part about this was making the Twit logo, honestly. It's just a <laughs> the flat The Sharpie plane. part? Uh, no, no, just, no, just like trying to make it so that it looks kind of like the Twit bug. Oh, okay, you know, okay. Making yeah. that 3D cutout part. Yeah, there's no dot. Where's yeah. the red dot on there? Now, version <laughs> 1. So we move over to version 1. Yeah. Um, I decided that... The battery coming out of the bottom, like it is here, if you go to the side view again, Alex, the battery coming out of the bottom, that was kind of, that's messy, that's hot glue, just to uh, keep this thing from yeah. yanking off, you know, because the last thing I wanted was for the, uh, the leads to come out and then short, because that would cause a lipo fire, and a lipo fire around <laughs> On your, your neck, body. Yeah. not a good idea, <laughs> no. not a good idea at all. So I created this, this was version one, revision one. 
And uh, as you can see, it still has the, the loop for the badge, so I can put my, my badge through there. Mm -hmm. But it also puts the battery hole at the top. So then you can loop it down? Well, what I was thinking was to put the battery at the back of your lanyard mm -hmm. so that you don't have all that weight hanging off your neck. You actually have half of it counterbalancing the badge. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I did that design, the problem was the battery, the lanyard actually just started rolling around because the heavy part wants to not be up here. It wants to be down below. So it was right. actually pulling the badge up to my neck. Yep. Not not a great okay. not a great look. This is why you want a fast prototype. This is why you want you, a fast prototype. You figure these things out as you put it together. Exactly. Yeah. And and I mean it was it was an hour every time I wanted to do another prototype. Right. Uh, but I would just toy around with it and see if it worked. So that that was a very short lived revision one. Okay. Revision two worked on this. So I improved the lid. Now instead of having it go through a clear material, I printed it out with black filament. And instead of trying to cut the uh, the logo into a single piece of of uh, a filament, mm -hmm. what I did was this this logo is now multiple pieces. There's the badge, there's this diffuser, right, and then there's the logo piece that fits inside the diffuser, right. And then you attach this with hot glue right, to the yeah. front panel. Yes, okay. I mean I didn't really have to, but again it was friction held, so right. I messed with it so much it started falling out. But when I put this in. Again, let's see if it'll actually stay this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I powered up. You'll notice that it looks a whole lot better than yeah, the original. Yeah, that looks now, sharp. Now, this is what you want. So it's, it's, it's got diffusion, mm -hmm. so I'm not getting solid lights going straight back into the camera or into someone's eye. And it also has that nice, the, the twit bug. Yeah, that looks cool. This is pretty cool, right? <laughs> it's a ghost now. Yeah. Actually, at that angle, it looks like one of the um, space invaders. Yeah, exactly. We can do that. Reverse speed. <laughs> <laughs> Re <laughs> increase speed. Drop down ten feet. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, this. So this is now revision one. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, revision one. We we've, we've gone from revision zero to revision one. Then we started getting kind of crazy. I started thinking. I don't like this whole battery outside the badge thing. It right. is kind of jank, and it also means it, it this tends to swing a lot. Yeah, and I can see it kind of resting on and kind of like angling the badge a little bit. Right, so I started thinking, what about having something that's entirely self-contained? So then you came up with revision, what are we on, four Revision now? two. So oh. revision two oh. went over to a larger box. Ooh. Uh, and actually, if you go to the side view again, Alex, what you see is I've got a couple of pieces here. I Notice how what I've done is I've started to break the build down into its component pieces. Rather than trying to make one big build, yeah. I'm saying, okay, let's let's get a, a lid, let's get a box, let's get a diffuser. These are the things that we need for this particular build. <laughs> they fit together really well, too. Right, and if you notice, I actually cut, let's see if I can get the light to shine properly. I, uh, there we go. There's holes here that allow me to, to pass wiring from the battery compartment over to the uh, to the, the the lighting compartment. Right. Yeah. So this was designed that a single one amp battery can go in there. That's cool. Yeah. And it does. So this this compartment is perfect for this this battery. The one problem is the wiring. Oh, no. I found out. That the, yeah, wiring not so great. <laughs> it it was really having issues. Uh, and I didn't, again, I didn't want to, to force it. It's a little tight, yeah. If I, if I short these wires out, I, I'm going to have a LiPo uh, <laughs> battery fire. But the other parts of, of this revision were I moved up to this. So you'll notice that this, this, this badge lid is slightly shrunken. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but it uses a larger diffuser with a larger logo element. And the idea behind this is I want to start making my lid so that these parts are interchangeable. So the box, once I have my box configuration. That's your standard, and then you can lay in different templates for like if you want to do different logos. Exactly. And stuff. I ah. want to put the know how logo in here. Do I want to put the before you buy logo in here? Or <laughs> this could be your knowledge hole. This could, yeah, exactly. I, I could actually put the, the Twit logo in there. Nice. And it also means I can, I can mess around with my logo because as you mentioned, there's no red dot. It, it, yeah. it looks, looks a little jank, but I can mess with my logo configuration as long as I stay within the, uh, the circumference of this lid. Right, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's pretty nifty. So we went from that to revision three. Now this, this box looks I've almost exactly the same. There are a couple of things. You'll notice that there's a new support that I added right here. Yeah, a little brace. Right, and the reason why I added that brace was twofold. One, I wanted to support the lid face because I didn't want that caving in if, mm -hmm. if it got hit. The second thing is I wanted two colors. I wanted my logo to be one color and I right. wanted 
my twit uh, lettering to be another color, and I needed something between them to keep oh, the, the colors light. from bleeding through. Right. Right. So that's what that does. That's my baffle, my my light baffle. I also increased the size of the battery compartment. So now the battery and the wiring can fit comfortably in here without having to pinch anything of it off. Very nice. Right. And uh, and then, well, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about, about revision four, but go ahead and come back to the wide. Uh, what, we, what we have here is this is what the fast prototyping process looks like. I did all of this in the course of an afternoon, and it was really, oh, you know, this is pretty good. I wonder what would happen if I extend the size of the, of the battery capa uh, cabin by, you know, another five millimeters. Right. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a progressive way of learning. I, I learn by mistakes, by making bad diffusers, mm -hmm. or by making these central uh, pieces that aren't exact to tolerance. You'll notice this once you start 3D printing. You may say five millimeters, but it's really 5.1 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And so if you're designing something to fit on such tight tolerances, you're going to find your pieces don't quite fit together fit together so if you were to send your model in the <laughs> like if you were to uh, build out one that you're happy with and then you sent in the um, the file to right. what was that website shape uh, shape shapeways yeah. um, could they put it within the tolerances yes that you they need? could because they have much better uh, equipment this looks really good, though. Are you still using the XYZ? Or? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, and what I've noticed is circles. So anything that's circular or curved, you're going to have a bit more slop. Now, yeah. let's, let's actually talk about that, because 3D printing is great for slop. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, we've got, um, we've got two. Is that, uh, Virgil is asking if the box is made out of acrylic. This is made out of PLA. PLA mm -hmm. is an organic-based plastic that uh, a lot of printers are using, because unlike ABS, it's not toxic. So you could have it in a closed room. It actually smells like... Corn. corn. Yeah. It smells like, like sugar corn. It's yeah. a sweet smell. And versus then, ABS, which tastes smells like burning plastic. <laughs> yeah, and like this tastes great. Wow. <laughs> Actually, you could eat it. It wouldn't kill you. Mm. It just wouldn't taste very good. I'd rather but not. Uh, I, I did want to bring up that you're gonna want to have some basic tools oh. because remember I mentioned the slot problem, right? Yeah. It's it's almost impossible to eliminate. I started playing by like decreasing the size of guessing how much the material was gonna expand and contract. Yeah. But that ends up being <laughs> Messy. That's okay. Yeah, don't do that. So have a Dremel tool. You 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 played with these, right? Uh, yeah, I have. Yeah, this is an old model. I've had this for a long time. This is a 400 XPR, uh, and the idea is it has an interchangeable set of tools. Uh, and Alex, if you go to the side view, or oh, actually go to the overhead view here, you can see uh, this is this is my Dremel set. So anytime I need to, to shape plastics, I use something like this to give me the, the various grinders and cutoff wheels and polish wheels, buffer wheels, uh, that, that allow me to fix nice. stuff that the, the 3D printer didn't do right. Now, do you have to be careful when you're doing that? Because won't it melt the plastic if you do it too long? Yes, yes, especially if you're using one of the, the, the big sanders. polishing wheels, yeah, yeah, the sanders. That will build up so much heat, it will just go right through the plastic. Yeah. Uh, so I tend to use this little, this burring, deburring tool. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, it's small enough, and I run it at a low enough speed that I can actually like run it around a circle. Because, uh, go ahead, uh, feel feel like the edges of this. You'll notice that's not a perfect circle. It's it's like a bunch of flat it, lines, right? Yeah, there's no such thing as a circle. It's just a bunch of little straight lines. Little straight lines. Well, what I can do is I can take the uh, the the Dremel tool and I just go around. And going around, eventually I'll rub off oh, all of those edges I and it see. becomes a circle. Sands it down, yeah. Exactly. And, and so this is, it's really, it's a finishing tool. You really need something like this in order to, to, to make it work properly, in order to, to make all the fast prototyping work. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, what we want to do is I actually want to show you some of the tools that you can use in the fast prototyping process. It's, uh, it's a little little something something that uh, I took back from Maker, but before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the second sponsor of this episode of Know How. Hey, uh, Brian, let me ask you something. Do you um, care about your parents? Uh, I do. I yeah. do. I worry about them. You worry about them? You know, uh, are you worried about people maybe peeking in the side door, seeing if they're home? Ringing the, the doorbell, maybe? Yeah, ringing the doorbell. See if anyone answers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That actually happens a lot, which is why we've got this. This is the Ring Video Doorbell. We've talked about this on the show before. Now, the Ring Video Doorbell is a doorbell, just like it sounds, but it's a, more than that. This kit is a self-contained security system for peace of mind. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you in just a bit, but first, let's show you what's inside the kit. Hey, Brian, you want to be my Vanna White? Oh, that's what I came on the show to do. Yeah. Oh, nice. We recharged it. Okay, so... <laughs> 
This, that's a doorbell, right? You push the button and it's gonna ring both outside and inside. And actually, if you flip this over, you'll find out that you can power it in one of two ways. There's a micro USB port there that allows you to charge the LiPo battery, which will give you one year of operation. Or you could hook it up to this little adapter, which allows it to receive charge from the doorbell, the actual doorbell that was at your front door. Now, if you don't have a doorbell, you just run it wirelessly. Okay, so it also includes all the tools that you're gonna need. It's got the driver, the drill, the screws, even the level that will allow you to make sure that you install it properly. Once you get this installed, it's kind of magical because what the Ring Video Doorbell will do is every time someone pushes the doorbell, it will ring your phone or your tablet, whatever it might be, your mobile device. It will allow you to see who's there and have a two-way conversation. But even, even more than that, it allows you to see what might be in the area. This is the Ring Video Doorbell I've got installed at my parents' house right now. Uh, uh, this tells me if anyone comes into the courtyard. It gives me a little motion detection warning. Uh, the cool thing about that is, wait, which way is up and down? I, I'm, I'm always confused. I'm confused. Uh, Alex, you wanna go back? There we go. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I could show it like that. There we go. And. and uh, Th this allows me to see if anyone is peeking into the courtyard. It allows me to see if... Oh, who, who, who is, is that? Wait, What's what? he doing? There's not supposed to be anybody there. Hmm. See, that's well, suspicious, folks. It's your neighbor taking the hose yeah, again. Actually, it could be. We, had a, I, we caught our neighbor plugging his electrical cables into our front outlet Sneaky. because he didn't want to drive up his power costs. Just, just saw him right over there. Yeah, yeah. The, but folks, this is what Ring lets you do. It lets you store these videos up to the cloud, download them to your devices so you have proof and, and really, it's for me, because I care about my parents, because I'm always worried about where they live, it, mm -hmm. it allows me to make sure that they're gonna be okay. Folks, I love our Ring Video Doorbell. I know you are too. Now, go ahead and try the device that was voted as the 2014 best device. It is the thing that you want. You want this in your home. Uh, right now, if you go to ring.com, you can get $10 off the normal price. Protect your home and have a peace of mind with Ring. Go to ring.com slash know-how. That's ring, R-I-N-G, dot com slash know-how. And we thank ring.com for their support of know-how. Hey, uh, you want to take another little trip over to Maker Fair? Yeah, I guess since I didn't actually get to go. Sorry about that. Hey, Alex, uh, let's go ahead and show them what kind of fast prototyping tools we got to play with in New York. So if you're a maker, you've probably used your Dremel tools. This is the VRT1. It's a, uh, a vacuum, vacuum rotary tool. The idea is if you have a shop vac, like the one I have down here, you can use that to both power the, uh, the tool and to keep your workspace free of debris. If you've ever used one of these tools, you know it can get a little bit messy. Quite simply, turn on your vacuum, engage the tool, and now not only can I use all of my attachments, but you'll see it vacuums up the debris from the workspace. This is actually a really good idea. If you have a makerspace in an area that you share with other people or that you really don't want to get messy, the VRT1 is for you. Makers are all about 3D printers, but if you want precision, if you want strength, nothing quite beats CNC, which is why I'm speaking with Ted Hall from ShopBot, who's going to explain how you can get precision out of one of their handy bots. Ted, thank you very much for speaking with us. Now, what am I looking at? Well, you're looking at a very small CNC tool. We think of it as a smart power tool. It's got intelligence and something that you can pick up, put down on a table, put down on your work material, put down on a board, or in this case, we put it on top of an accessory that has an additional turning option underneath. I couldn't have said it better myself about 3D printing is great, but sometimes you need to make stuff with uh, real materials that uh, uh, can scale as well. And uh, we think this uh, little tool that combines uh, a lot of precision and power is one way to get at that. Can you guide me through what kind of materials I can print with? I see we've, we've got wood here, we've got acrylic, we've even got aluminum. What, what kind of experience did I, do I need in order to be able to properly machine these materials? 
Well, you're right. The, one of the advantages of the subtractive technique is that you usually have a wider range of materials available to you. And with handy butts, wood, foam, plastics, acrylics of one sort or another, um, soft metals like aluminum and brass are all copper, are all machinable. You can make printed circuit boards, that kind of thing. Um, the, the skill level is a step higher than people often conceptualize 3D printing. There's a little bit more than click to print. But increasingly, the tools from getting from a CAD drawing or a model of what you want to make to the actual part are getting better and a lot easier to do. And so we're thinking, yeah, it's one step harder than 3D printing, but it's well within the grasp of anybody who's at all comfortable with drawing or creating in, uh, in CAD. Gives you. All right, big question. Our, our audience is going to want to know, if they wanted to start in CNC and, and perhaps start with one of your smaller units, what is it going to run them and, and then how far can they go if they wanted to start building larger objects? Well, these tools cost uh, $2,800, 2795 We've been selling them for several years and we think that's a, a great way to get into CNC just because of the range of materials and kind of work that a handy bot will do. Um, and you can do much bigger pieces by taking the tool and tiling across a larger area. But at some point that gets efficient, inefficient, and if you're really looking towards cutting large sheets of plywood or something like that, you want a CNC tool that's got a larger format to it. Ted Hall, thank you very much for speaking with us. Now, if they wanted to find out more about the HandyBot, where they might be able to pick one up, or maybe where they can get something fab by one of your partners, where can they go? Well, you can find out all about HandyBots on the HandyBot website if you don't make it to Maker Fair here this weekend. So it's HandyBot.com, um, and there's all sorts of samples and videos of the tool in action. ShopBot sponsors a larger network of digital fabbers that include people with CNC tools, 3D printers, laser cutters, and the network is called 100kgarages.com, 100,000garages.com. You can go to that on the website and find somebody in your neighborhood who will help you make something with Digital Fab. We'll teach you how to use it and help get you involved or just make your parts for you. Again, Ted Hall, thank you very much. If you're a maker, give yourself a hand. D-Bot. Hand D-Bot. Yeah. You got that? Yeah, yeah, that. I try to ignore it. You know, those that's gold, man. That's cool. You're just, that's, I'm throwing pearls before swine. That's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> uh, gotta knock those softballs out of the park. <laughs> oh, we're gonna be bringing you some more coverage from Maker Fair because there. I mean, I every year that we go, I am so impressed with how far we've come along. It wasn't too long ago that the only way to get a 3D printer was to build one yourself. That. Yeah. required a lot of calibration, was always going out of calibration, right. it had jams galore, and now I've got, I've got a $349 printer sitting in my lab that it's not the biggest build platform, but you know, no. it, it can do things like this. Right, and the, the only thing you really have to worry about is changing out the head every once in a while. Yeah, clean out the head, change out the head, and, and change out the filament when you need it. That's, it, it really is a revolution, and right. there's some people in the chat room who are saying, look, we are right, right on the edge of being able to have every major piece of gear that you might need in, right. in your maker lab to be a fab. It, you can cut through metals and woods. You'll be able to scan. You'll be able to 3D print. You'll be able to laser cut. You'll be able to CNC. I mean, it's, and you'll be able to do all that for under four grand. Yeah, it's pretty cool how everything is starting to shrink down and become more affordable. But the thing that I was impressed with that CNC machine was how smooth everything looked. Right. Like, that was, that was some pretty stuff that he had showed it off really there. Is. It really is. Now, what we want to do is we want to go ahead and move you to version 4 of the badge. <gasps> this was like version 1, we right. have version 2, we've had revision 3. I, I want to go ahead and move over to revision 4, but let me show you how the design choices actually worked for that. Now, if you go ahead and, and play our little bit of, uh, of B-roll, you'll allow us to, to show them that there were a few things that were driving my design for the Twit Badge. So I wanted different colors for the logo and the name. I wanted all day battery life. I wanted wired management and I wanted enough room in the case to tinker for future improvements. Now to get these things done, I, I first chose my power source. That drove a lot of the, the decisions because it, mm -hmm. it meant I had to expand or contract that battery compartment you see right there. Right. I needed at least 76 millimeters of width, 36 millimeters of length and 24 millimeters of height to comfortably fit the battery and the wiring. 
However, the, the, the V4 battery compartment was larger than the version 3, so I actually had to shrink the badge compartment because I, I was already at the max size on my build plate. Oh, for your bed. Right, I couldn't make it any longer, otherwise it wouldn't fit on, on, my, on my plate. So I, I made the badge compartment just slightly smaller, just just so that I could I could give it to the uh, to the battery compartment. Right. I also wanted to add extra room in the enclosure to hide wiring regulators and other gear. So I added a few extra millimeters to the height of the build, uh, just to, to give me some you know so I'm not squeezing everything in there. Also because I didn't want wires coming up against the lights because right. then it would block the lights. Uh, the entire badge is made up of six 3D printed pieces. There's the badge box which you see on screen, the lid, the battery cover, the inner circle, and then that logo that goes into the diffuser. Now the diffuser allows me to take the light from the LEDs and turn it into something more, well, you know, even rather than spotlights. Mm -hmm. uh, when assembled, that logo goes into that inner circle and the inner circle fits into the lid. Then both the lid and the battery cover will snap onto the box. Uh, uh, the electronics are actually really simple. I ran a strip of blue SMD LEDs around the perimeter of the inner circle, then a strip of red SMD LEDs around the perimeter of the twit title. I soldered a female JST connector directly to the red uh, LED LEDs, then soldered lines from the red LEDs to the blue LEDs. So it's all just one long uh, serial connection. Mm -hmm. uh, once in place, I snapped a diffuser over the red LEDs to give the twit name that more even glow. Otherwise, it would, again, look like spotlights in the back of the twit name. Uh, and uh, the, the inner ring for the logo act as the diffuser for the, the blue LEDs. Uh, with that lights, uh, with those lights that you see there and the diffusers in place, I can put the battery into that battery compartment. I can light it up and, and this is what I get. It's a nice even lighting. Um, a little, I, I would like a bit more power over, the, uh, over the, the blue LEDs, but as you can see, that's, that's what the diffuser does to those red LEDs. Right. So it, it, it turns it into more of a glow strip rather than glow lights. And uh, once I strap in the, uh, the diffuser, of, uh, into the, the lid and put the lid onto the box and then put the battery lid over the battery box. Looks pretty I cool. Get, uh, I get myself a little bit of a, a nice little badge there. Nice. And uh, that is the revision four, four. Of, uh, of my battery box. And uh, yeah, folks, this, this is what it looks like. Uh, Brian, if you want to hold this up, this, this is the future of, uh, of Twit at uh, live events. It's so pretty. It is, it is very, very pretty. Yeah. Not bad, Padre. Yeah, yeah. I can see why it took you four tries to get this right. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? The nice thing about this is, again, there is enough room in there for me to tinker. I've already started Revision 5. So in Revision 5, I'm doing a few things. One, I want to increase the power going yeah. to the blue LEDs. Because those blue LEDs, you'll little, notice... A little low. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's, not, it's not so great. I don't, I don't like that. Uh, I, I want it to be a lot brighter hmm. than that. And... Um, the other thing is I might switch from LEDs to electroluminescence, so EL strips instead, because yeah. uh, I can actually cut that into the shape of, of the circle. Um, I think it will make mm. the wiring a bit less complicated, even though I'm going to have to put an inverter inside of it to, to make it work properly. And yeah. you can just pop this yeah, all yeah, off? Here. Actually, here, uh, you keep that on there. And uh, if you just pop this off, you can see what's inside. So again, that's that's just what you saw in the videos. I, I'm thinking about putting some LEDs in this area. Right. It requires a bit more fine soldering, but um, oh well. <laughs> the other thing I want to do is because I've got so much space in here, there is enough space for me to put a very small Arduino plus a wireless RF chip right. plus 32 gigabytes of memory. And so I'm thinking DEF CON next year, <laughs> this badge will also double as a hotspot. And if you connect to the hotspot, hot spot, it will serve out a web page mm -hmm. that will let you download know-how episodes. <laughs> and what kind of battery life are you thinking of getting on that? Well, um, so this 1,000 milliamp battery with just the LEDs, this will run all day. This will run yeah. 10 hours, 15 hours. If I put in the Arduino with the wireless chipset, I'll have to just swap out the battery every two hours. Uh, well, we it's have okay. lots of batteries. Yeah, it's easy to swap these things out. Yeah. Uh, but you know, again, this is the sort of stuff that you get to do with fast prototyping. That's why I'm, I'm really kind of in love with this, this maker movement. Right. I can, I've always been able to make stuff like this. This is easy. But normally it was me like putting together cardboard boxes or carving something out of a right. wooden enclosure. This actually looks good. Um, this is something that I could I could give to someone and say, yeah, here, here's here's a twit badge for you. Have fun. Right. Um, and I wouldn't feel bad because it looks so so <laughs> jank and one off. Uh, so go figure. There okay. You go. So all right, I, we've learned the benefits of fast prototyping today, and uh, I don't, I, f 
I've done a lot of projects like that too before where the second or the third time, like I could have done it a lot better, but because I didn't have a 3D printer, I was right. using cardboard or little, I, I always think of the NES project that we did way, way, way back where we modded the case. Mm -hmm. How much easier would it have been yeah, exactly. to mount things? And even if you had used that exterior case, just to make a case that fits inside the case, right. and then you just screw down the parts, oh, I so much easier. I kind of want to revisit that project now, because thinking back on it, I, I was really upset with the little wood pieces that we used <laughs> in it. Well, that's really it. Wood pieces and a lot of hot glue. A, a lot whole of hot, lot glue. Of hot glue. Yeah. And that's the way we used to do it, is just jam it in there. Now, we don't have to. We yeah. can make a custom case uh, or adapter that will allow us to mount anything in anything. And I think my favorite part is once you have it built, then as you put things together or you come up with ideas of additions, you realize what you have to change. Right. You know, because when you were doing revision one or the first version, you realize like, oh, like I need yeah. a place for the battery. Put those next to each other. Oh, look at that. I'm a little nostalgic for this one. <laughs> How can you be nostalgic for version something you one. just saw? Yeah, version one. I remember the days when this badge was cool. Now we didn't have Wi-Fi and our badges. Are you we gonna, liked it. Are you going to come out with a version 4S soon? Or yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the 4S is just huge. It's like the ch yeah. it's chest size. <laughs> yeah, the 4S <laughs> Plus. Yeah. Well, it's like a dinner plate. The other thing I thought about doing was just incorporating a uh, thing on the back for conference badges actually to go. Oh, to like slide in Right, or to slide in so that it can be, I, this is the only thing I wear and I just, when I they want to check my ID, I turn that around. Otherwise, yeah. it's, it's twit, baby. <laughs> wow. But there's so much you can do. And like you were saying, you know, you, you get to that point where you want to continue, but it's too much effort. Right. Fast prototyping is really about getting rid of that step. Yeah. You should never get to a point where you go, oh, this is almost perfect. There's one thing I'd like to change, but it would take too much time. No, it doesn't yeah. anymore. If, if I don't like something on this design, it is as simple as me opening up my Tinkercad files, right. which again, it's free, tinkercad.com. Make the change, output to an SDL file, drop it into my 3D printer, and an hour or two later, I've got the new part. And it, it, it's really that simple. So fast prototyping isn't just about the tools you have, it's about changing your mindset of how quickly I can get out a new revision. It's so cool. It is so, so cool. Well, folks, if you want to try making your own Twit Badge, we're going to make all of the Revision 4 STL files available. They'll be in our show notes so that you'll be able to download them and print them on your own. Uh, and also, I will be updating them as we go. So as I add Raspberry Pis or Arduinos to it, I'll make sure to give you those STL files. We, we don't want, we're not going to keep anything and hoard it to ourselves. As we make it, we want to make it available for you to print it. So This show is open source. We are open source. <laughs> and, and you know what? If you make a better version, if you take our SDL files and you know, you say, you know what, it would be better if you made it wider or taller, or I bet you could reduce weight by doing this or that, share that back with us. We'd love to show it off. We'd love to see what you do with what we give you. And, and Brian, wh where do they go to find all that stuff? Uh, they can find that at our website, twit.tv slash kh, and that's where all our past episodes live too. So if you want to subscribe or find a, uh, an older episode, that's the place to go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, don't forget that we have a presence on the social medias other than, than, than that. <laughs> we're you, all over the place. We're all over yeah. the place. You can find yeah. us on Twitter. I'm twitter.com slash PadreSJ. And I'm at Cranky underscore Hippo. And our director, what's his name again? Uh, Grumple? Grumple. Grumple. That's, that's Gumple. Right. I think he was a little distracted oh, Hal, today. Oh, Hal, Hal Gumpel. Hal, 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 Howard. Howard. Howard? Me, I'm, I'm, uh, oops. <laughs> I'm, I'm training, <laughs> yeah, uh, talk, talking about distracted. I'm training our new guy on the... Uh, on how the TriCaster works. So I'm explaining the layering of how everything works here while I'm also directing a show. It's very wow. exciting. We should, we should just I'm not distracted at all. No how episode <laughs> on that. <laughs> we, we really could. Also, don't forget, folks, that uh, if you jump into the Google Plus group, uh, it, I can't stress enough how much I really enjoy it. It yeah. is a community. It's people who like to post stories about things that they're excited about, who like to post pictures of their projects. In fact, in the next episode, we, I know we've, we've kind of been bad about doing feedback from the groups. So the next episode, next week, we're, we're really, we're going to bring as many as we can in because we want to show off the things that you've been doing. Some, some of you have been doing projects that are absolutely fantastic. Just call it like the community episode or something. There is. There's, there's, someone made a fantastic main machine. Uh, of course, there's a bunch of quadcopter projects and a bunch of quadcopter crashes. Keep sending those in. Those are, those are <laughs> a lot of fun. But uh, again, plus, go, just go to Google Plus and, and look for the know-how group and join up. We're over 9,000. It feels so good to say that. It really, really does. Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasare. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go print it.
Go badge it. Badger. We, we don't need no stinking badger. badges. Badger. Badger.